Rosie. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, and we're the plastics. We spent the last month starting studying different filtration methods of microplastics. I'm Riley, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm Bunny. I'm Bunny. I'm from Queens, New York. And we're the plastics. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so microplastics are small plastic particles in our environment that are generally smaller than 5 millimeters. They're found everywhere. They're in our toothpastes, they're in our face washes, they're in our laundry, and they're made from the breakdown of macroplastics, and unfortunately, they're in our waters. So some of you may be wondering, why do microplastics matter? Well, microplastics are not biodegradable. When in water, they release toxins that don't just go away. These toxins released by microplastics have been compared to metals, polychlorinated biphenyls, and other toxic contaminants. As these microplastics accumulate in our waters, fish and other marine animals may mistake these plastics for fish eggs and eat them. Then assuming the fish doesn't die due to eating microplastics, someone may come along and eat said fish, and then they'll have consumed the microplastics consumed by the fish. One thing we learned about this semester was salt marsh ecosystem services, one of which being that they can act as sponges, filtering through pollutants. So we asked ourselves, well, can salt marshes filter through microplastics too? Before doing this project, we attempted to do some research as to how salt marshes deal with microplastics. To our surprise, we found nothing. <laughs> there was absolutely no information about this topic, but that only made the research more exciting. We hypothesized that there would be fewer microplastics in the water exiting the marsh than in the water entering it, because the marsh would most likely soak most of the pollutants up. So, to kick off our data collection, we headed to Scarborough Salt Marsh. To collect our data, we located on a map where water would enter the marsh, the blue dot, and where water would exit the marsh, the yellow dot. We used a jar to take a water sample at the entrance and at the exit. Also at the location where we took the exit sample, we took a sample of the mud. So next we went to the Wells Salt Marsh to take our next three samples, and we repeated the same process as before. The blue dot is where our entrance sample was taken, and the yellow dot is where our exit sample was taken. We analyzed our data by counting the number of microplastics per milliliter. Our samples from the Scarborough Salt Marsh gave us some interesting information. We found that there are 0 0.038 microplastics per milliliter in our entrance sample, 0 0.044 microplastics per milliliter in our exit sample, and a shocking amount of microplastics in our mud sample, 0.34 per milliliter. We calculated that at the entrance of the Wells Marsh, there are about 0 0.026 microplastics per milliliter. At the exit, there are about 0 0.013 microplastics per milliliter, and about 0 0.078 microplastics per milliliter of mud. The data from both marshes support our hypothesis because there was a collectively smaller number of microplastics in the exit samples than in the entrance samples. Additionally, the highest microplastic abundance was found in the mud samples, which supports the thought that the marshes are absorbing many of the microplastics. So what does all this data mean? The marsh is reducing the amount of microplastics that enter our waterways, which is great. But what isn't great is that the organisms that live in the marsh and use it as a nursery are at greater risk of ingesting these plastics. All right, so marshes filter microplastics on a very large scale, such a large scale that we don't really have control over it. So we were interested in finding ways that we could do the same things marshes are doing, filtering microplastics, but on a smaller scale. For this, we turn to our laundry. As mentioned before, one source of microplastics comes from doing laundry, specifically from washing washings to the synthetic materials. This led us to the question whether attaching a filter to the washing machine drain pipe could decrease our microplastic output. We hypothesized that if we determined microplastic abundance in unfiltered, sponge filtered, and cheesecloth filtered laundry water, the unfiltered laundry water would have the highest microplastic abundance. So we did three loads of laundry. We wash the same clothes each time to keep our results consistent. 
We washed a pair of jeans, a pair of fleece pants, a pair of sweatpants, a hoodie, a cotton t-shirt, socks, long underwear, three pairs of underwear, and athletic shorts, a typical load of laundry. For each load, we secured the drain pipe into a plastic trash bin so that we could catch all the water leaving the washing machine. We took a water sample from each of our loads and calculated the number of microplastics per milliliter in each. What we found as far as microplastic abundance in our laundry surprised us. The sheer abundance was the first surprising thing, as we found there to be an average of 1.7 microplastics per milliliter in unfiltered laundry water. The sponge filter was not very effective, but the cheesecloth filter was extremely effective, as we found only 0.4 microplastics per milliliter in that water. This supported our hypothesis, because there were over four times as many microplastics in the unfiltered water than the water which had been filtered by the cheesecloth. It makes sense that the cheesecloth worked better as a filter than the sponge because it was made of a finer material. So our results prompted us to ask even more questions. Should filters be widely used? What other materials would work even better than cheesecloth at filtering microplastics? Filters should, in theory, be widely used. In practice, it brings to question how one would dispose of microplastics once the filter has been filled. Additionally, as to what other materials would prove to be better filtered than cheesecloth, a very fine mesh, such as a micron mesh, mesh net, specifically designed to filter through very small objects, would likely work even better. So this picture is of Rosie and Buddy holding up the unraveled cheesecloth, and you can tell by all the, like the gunkins, the black stuff, that's the debris from our laundry, and so you can tell it actually worked. Now that you know more about microplastics, I'm sure you're wondering how you can decrease your microplastic pollution. First and foremost, limit your overall plastic consumption. You can do this by buying reusable water bottles and plastic and cloth bags, paper and cloth bags instead of plastic ones. Also, don't buy products that contain microbeads. You can often tell just by looking at the product whether they contain microbeads. In the ingredients list, they will be called polyethylene. But for a more extensive list of products, Google search cosmetic microplastic producers and select the first result, beatthemicrobead.org. Lastly, educate others. Tell them about the negative effects of microplastics and how they can reduce their own pollution. This project never would have come together if it weren't for the support of everyone in the CSG community. Our marine science teacher, Carrie Whitaker, and TA Laura Carson were huge helps. From driving us all over Maine to collect data, to giving us extremely constructive and prompt feedback, they were there to help throughout the entire process. Most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and supporting us.